You're listening to Dirty Feet, a dance podcast. I'm Allison Burns. Allison here. No surprise there. I'm just butting in right before we get to our interview for this episode with a little bit of shameless self promotion. So I moved to Ottawa recently. You may have noticed by the change in content from Montreal-based artists to a lot of Ottawa-based artists and artists who are moving through the city. I'm very excited to announce that I will be presenting my own work for the first time in the city in June at the Ottawa Fringe Festival. The show is called Do You Want to Live Forever? And it features myself, local dancer Alia Graham, and Travis Martin, who is also writing poetry for the show. There are a few additional guest artists who will remain unnamed. I'm bringing it up so early because we're doing a fundraiser at the end of April. So if you are in the city or planning on being in the city for April 30th, stop on by. The fundraiser will start at 7 p.m. at the Gladstone Theatre, which is at 910 Gladstone Avenue. Cross Street is Preston. Look out for the event. It's called How to Live Forever. It will be a showcase evening of whimsy, performances, drinks, and good company. An event to celebrate the pleasures of life, if not the extension of it. And all the funds raised in this evening will be put towards the artist fees for the Fringe show. Some of the performers in the evening you've heard of already. Sarah Hopkin will be performing a contemporary dance excerpt. Nora Patton doing a bit of theater for us. Marie-Michelle Darvaux is also going to be doing a contemporary dance piece. Brian McConville and a friend will be doing a Latin dance improv. Travis will, of course, be reading poetry from the show, and I will do a little dance from the show. Laura Toller, from a recent episode, will be doing something yet to be revealed. The cost is pay what you can. Suggested ticket prices of $20 or $30 if, if you're feeling generous, or $10 if you're feeling strapped for cash. You can pay in advance by visiting the Gladstone website, or you can pay at the door. If you're not in town, but you still want to support the project, please go ahead and purchase your ticket online. There's plenty to spare. We would really appreciate your support. Again, that's How to Live Forever, a showcase fundraiser on April 30th at 7 o'clock at the Gladstone Theatre here in Ottawa, Ontario. Okay, that's all the time I'm going to take for my shameless self-promotion. We're going to move on now to this week's episode. This episode of the Dirty Feet podcast is taking a different approach to dance. I'm going to be speaking with De La Salle student Mathilde Papillon, and uh, she has uh, just finished up a TEDx Canada talk uh, on some of the things we're going to cover today in our conversation. Uh, Mathilde, you are very active, and uh, and you keep yourself quite busy with a variety of different <laughs> things. Thank you for taking the time to come join me today. It's my pleasure. Thank you very much. Oh. I'm very excited about this conversation. (laughs) So De La Salle is a French arts high school here in Ottawa. I attended the English counterpart, Canterbury, (laughs) uh, which I've spoken about before. Um, But we're going to take our time with this conversation. We're going to talk about what you presented for TEDx. And we're also going to talk about your uh, latest dance piece Mm -hmm. that uh, goes kind of beyond just your interest in dance and choreography and goes into your other interests, including science. Uh, Let's talk first about De La Salle. And can you give our our listeners an idea of what the arts high school experience is like with De La Salle? Right. So at De La Salle, we're very lucky. We have eight different concentrations, they're called. Um, I'm in the dance concentration So since grade nine, I have gotten the chance to dance every single day, an hour and 15 minutes every day from Monday to Friday. The dance program at De La Salle is really special in the sense that uh, we look at modern and contemporary dance mostly, and there is a huge emphasis placed on creation. So um, making our own work and taking it in our own way. And I think that 
that approach to dance has really helped me shape my own opinions about, um, well, I guess what we're going to talk about <laughs> soon enough. Sure. So let's talk about how, um, and this was, this was true of my high school too, you know, you're in your final year, you get to create your kind of, your biggest work to date, right? <laughs> so tell us about this, this grade 12 project that you put together. So from start to finish, I'm responsible for uh, this entire choreography. It started in September with auditions. So I auditioned all of the dancers in the younger grades, 9 through 11, and chose six of them to be part of my choreography. Uh, I knew from the start what I wanted to, um, to do with this amazing opportunity. So since grade nine, I have been, no, actually since grade seven, I've been in the gifted program at school. I love learning. I love the sciences. I love math. Um, and I think that there's a divide between dance and STEM right now. Um, and that's really unfortunate. In the dance program at school, I've always sort of felt different in that sense that, you know, oh, like, I, I really enjoy speaking about um, scientific principles and math. And in the same regard, in my science and math classes, I'm generally the only dancer. <laughs> so it creates this weird... Um, sort of gap. I've noticed this weird gap between the two um, groups. And I thought that with this choreography that I could do all by myself, start to finish, it would be a great opportunity to sort of explore that relationship between science and dance that is not being explored right now at all. <laughs> so what does that look like? How do you start to blend those two interests? Um, I think that there are many, many ways to approach this sort of relationship, but the approach that I've taken is using dance as a solution to one of um, the scientific community's problems, which is uh, communication. So the facts, uh, the, the research, a lot of it isn't getting out there right now, really important information that needs to get out there. You can talk about climate change, about vaccines, etc. And I think that um, dance might be a solution to that, to making that information accessible and readily available to the general public. So that's sort of the approach I'm taking my choreography. Um, namely, I'm explaining Einstein's theory of special relativity. So if dance can explain this theory, which is considered one of the most complex theories out there, then it can explain pretty much anything, right? That's the logic. So if I can sort of pinpoint a method to create movement based on scientific principles and algorithms, etc., then I can, anybody could duplicate that and use it again with another principle of some sort. Sure, and this this of course makes me think of dance your PhD. Yes, <laughs> which is uh, which is a very cool project, uh, I believe, based in the states, yes. where people um, submit uh, choreographic versions of their PhD thesis, whatever it might be, and uh, there's I believe an award for for mm -hmm. kind of the best one each year. Uh, so you end up with with like a biology. PhD candidate submitting a choreography about pigeons and how they interact with each other yeah. and things like this. Uh, so maybe given that uh, example that you are aware of, what, uh, yeah, where does your project line up with, with Dance Your PhD as an idea? I think it's similar um, in the sense that, you know, dance can make more accessible some material that very little people would, would read or take the time to understand otherwise. <laughs> so many PhDs out there go unread. Mm -hmm. um, and that's absolutely the reason for that project. Too, exactly. Right? It's that, that's the motivation. Um, I'd say that my project, on top of, of accessibilizing the scientific material, I'm also very aware of the fact that a lot of dancers aren't very much in touch with STEM. So as much as 
the objective is to bring dance, is to bring the science out there. It's also about um, bringing the science in the dance community and being like, hey, like, yes, you're in dance, but that doesn't mean that you can't be good at science or you can't be good at math. I will never forget the day in grade nine that someone said, um, if you're good at math, you can't be good at dance. And if you're good at dance, you can't be good at math. And that sort of stigma, well, it, it, it hurt at first. And then I, I decided, no, that's not true. <laughs> um, so Dance Your PhD is a wonderful project. And I think that my project sort of aligns with it in the sense that it's bringing science out there, but it's also bringing science in, in the dance community itself. Yeah. Yeah, in addition to that, you're also an environmentalist and humanitarian. <laughs> and as, I, as I mentioned at the top, you just, you keep yourself quite busy. Yes. <laughs> um, so so what what is dance in your life, to your life? Is it one facet of many? Does it... It, it's it's evolved. It's it used to be, you know, dance is Monday nights and the dance program at school, and I sort of kept it isolated from everything else. Um, I saw it as the not almost as a hobby, but it was this very specific part of my life that I didn't um, mix with my environmental projects and my um, academic projects. But as I grew older and I started making connections between dance and the other sort of parts of my life, I've come to realize the potential that it has. So a lot of people um, sort of fall in love with dance and movement and I'd say that I fell in love with dance's potential. <laughs> it's raw, sheer potential to change the way we think about things and um, change the public that, that receives that information. To be clear, you're, you're talking to a dance nerd right now, so definitely <laughs> in your camp. Uh, however, I can't ignore the fact that dance is... is um, an underappreciated art form, yes. and it has a small reach uh, in today's society. And I'm wondering how that factors into mm -hmm. um, using this as a tool to reach people. I think it's it's a two way street solution. So dance as a solution to science is the first sort of way I can explain my project. But the other way is science as a solution to dance. So we have two ostracized communities. So dance, as you were saying, doesn't have a very big reach. But similarly, scientists' reach is growing smaller and smaller and smaller today. So even though dance is public is quite small today, I think that um, using it as a way to explain science would make that public much larger. So the solution in itself is, I think, sort of a cycle. The more we use it, the more we put dance out there as a medium of communication for science, I think the bigger the, its public will be, and then it just keeps going and growing. Cool. Yeah. And you're walking the walk as you brought dance to the <laughs> stage of TEDx in Canada recently. Can you talk to us about uh, how that experience uh, came about and what that was like? It was amazing. So I knew once I started my choreography in the fall that I needed a bigger public than the end of year show at De La Salle. I knew that I had a message that I wanted to uh, have as many people as possible hear about this um, because, again, it comes down to the size of the public, right? So I thought, well, I need a bigger platform. <laughs> and I found TEDx Canada online and signed up to, um, to audition. And so they got 80 uh, nominations for auditions. They picked around 15 to audition. So in November... Uh, I presented an excerpt of my piece that I had then. 
about um, special relativity. Uh, I got selected um, along with eight other speakers. And so in the beginning of March, we presented in front of 350 people and the video should be up online very soon. So it, it was very, very exciting because I had done public speaking before um, for um, environmental, academic, other reasons, but I hadn't had the chance yet to speak about this idea I had had. And it was really cool to talk with members of the audience afterwards, physicists and um, business people. And they were all saying, well, you know, this is a brilliant idea. Um, I had one man who um, has a PhD in physics and he said, I've never understood general relativity so well. <laughs> That's amazing. Yeah. It was, it was a validating experience. Because it's it's sort of an idea that I have by myself. Can't really share it with many people. I can share it with dance people, share it with STEM people, but no one really truly appreciates it until it's up there on stage with six dancers proving that, yeah, Einstein's theory can be danced. <laughs> there you go. Yeah, and you've also been able to take it out of the ecosystem of, of your high school and kind of bring it to exactly. a, a general public. Bigger stage. Yeah. What's, what's the next step in this process? Well, finishing the piece. <laughs> so I presented about 30 seconds of it at TEDx. And the whole thing, I'm aiming for six minutes. I'm at like five minutes right now. And the show is at the end of April. So the immediate objective is to present it then. It will be um, really, really cool to see the final product on stage because I've been dreaming about this for a long time now. In terms of the bigger picture, I would love to continue promoting this relationship. So I'm pursuing physical sciences at McGill next year. And I know that the first year course load is intense, but I want to figure some way that I can continue not only dancing, but exploring that relationship. I... Um, got accepted at Concordia in the dance program there, and I have friends that are going there. So my sort of plan right now is to somewhat collaborate with students at Concordia, maybe do some research. Um, there are a lot of grants out there that support this kind of initiative. So hopefully I'll, I'll keep exploring in university. But for now, the immediate objective is to present the piece in April. <laughs> So let's talk about resources where people can stay up to date on what you're working on. We can definitely go to TEDxCanada.com. Um, they have a YouTube channel there. But, of course, if the YouTube um, videos are uploaded, the links will be on their website. Um, in terms of following my dance progress there isn't really much out there <laughs> um yeah no I can't think of anything the school has twitter but they don't post about dance so <laughs> <laughs> that's pretty much it the the video should be up in a few weeks and hopefully it'll be seen by many that's my hope <laughs> so I imagine since you've done it already once we'll just You'll make a big splash the next time you do a big public <laughs> presentation. Hopefully. We'll about it. Yeah, hopefully. Good. Um, any last thoughts about dance and science and the future? I just, I think that it's, it's something we need right now. It's a relationship that we need. Dance needs to keep growing. Um, Science needs to be more efficient. Scientists need to be more efficient. Drop the 50-page PDF. Drop the three-hour lectures. And I think the public could really use a little bit more dance in their lives and could really use a little bit more scientific information and facts in their lives. So this partnership, I think, is key. So hopefully we'll we'll see it in the future somewhere. <laughs> Do you have an opinion on what we could use a little less of to make space for science and dance? Um, well, the traditional mediums of communication for science, such as those 50-page black and white PDFs in the back of a 
journal somewhere on the internet and um, those three-hour lectures on YouTube. And it's always, it's always a white man in a suit. He's generally 50 or 60 in front of a blackboard explaining something for three hours. That's, that's like the, the typical, I know, because I, I teach myself a lot of, like that's how I taught myself Einstein's theory before putting it into movement. And if one really wants to grasp that information right now, those are the resources available. PDFs and videos of, of men explaining. And I think that, you know, it'd be really, really nice to see a little bit less of that. Mm -hmm. And a little more ladies dancing. A little more <laughs> dance. Yeah. Excellent. Yeah. Great. I've been speaking with Mathilde Papillon, and she is a student at uh, De La Salle here in Ottawa. And she just uh, wrapped up a TEDx Canada talk uh, about the very thing we've been discussing today. Uh, so you should go check that out on their website. And uh, we'll stay tuned for, for future projects. I look forward to seeing what, what comes next from you. Thank you. Thank you. You've been listening to Dirty Feet. I'm Alison Burns with a few thank yous. First to Paula Flalo in the No More Radio Network. Also to Mainline Theatre and Montreal Improv Theatre. And to all present and past team members who can be found on our website, dirtyfeetpodcast.com. You can also find us on Facebook at Dirty Feet Podcast and follow us on Twitter at Dirty Dirty Feet. Thank you for listening. Until next time.